Well, thank you very much, Mayor Sessoms, members of council. It is indeed a pleasure to be here this afternoon for part two of the briefing on the recurrent flooding in the Eastern Shore Drive drainage area. <clears throat> part one was given back last fall in September. It was about the interim improvements. Today's presentation focuses on the comprehensive as well as the general topic of sea level rise and recurrent flooding. Today, I'm going to be answering five questions, just what is the Eastern Shore Drive area? <coughs> what actions have been taken thus far? Just why exactly is this area experiencing recurrent flooding? What are the general things we can do about it? And what specific measures are we going to be talking about now today? This is the Eastern Shore Drive area. It's bounded by the Chesapeake Bay and Long Creek on the north and south, Lynn Haven Inlet on the west, and the State Park on the east, if you will, it's the duckbill of the duckhead area of, of the city, for those of you that look at your maps like that. In September, we did brief you on a package of interim improvements. They were authorized. They consisted of five check valves and three sluice gates. Uh, those uh, measures do reduce flood frequency. They do not eliminate flooding, but they reduce flood frequency for 40 homes and almost 7,500 feet of roadway. The green stars show the location of the check valves. They're in what we call a tidally adjacent area of Lynn Haven Colony. Those are the lowest areas where all the boating channels are. Those um, check valves have been installed. These are just some photos of, of the installation. It's actually an insert that goes inside the pipe. It's held in place by expansion rings. If you look at the lower right, you can see the one-way valve in that insert there. Keeps the tide out, but lets some of the rainwater flow out. The three sluice gates are under design. Two, they all go in Cape Henry Drive ditch. They're shown by the green stars. Two by Great Neck Road, one down by First Landing Lane. Uh, they require more permanent installation with, autom with automated controls. So we're designing them now. We hope to install them later this year or early next year. So next question I want to address, and this is somewhat of, of a repeat from last fall, is why is this area experiencing recurrent flooding? Well, first of all, flooding is really a major issue for a lot of the residents that live out in this area. At the same time, flooding is definitely getting worse out there. Sea level is rising. And it does appear as if coastal storm frequency and intensity may be getting, getting greater. I'm going to take the next two or three slides to look at sea level rise and what's going on with coastal storms. Sea level rise, you know, there's a lot of studies, you know, a lot of data, and quite frankly, a lot of opinions about what's going on with sea level rise. We kind of wade through that and go right to the NOAA tide gauges in our area, the two closest being Sewell's Point in Norfolk and the first island of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. That data indicates sea level's been rising about a quarter of an inch a year. Doesn't sound like much, but that's a foot in 50 years. And in fact, the data suggests that sea level has risen almost a foot in the last 50 years. Now, in 2012, the General Assembly requested VIMS, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, to provide them a comprehensive report on sea level rise, recurrent flooding. VIMS delivered that report in January of 13, and the main finding in it was that the Commonwealth should start planning for another foot and a half to three feet of sea level rise to occur within the next 50 years. Hold on just a second. Sure. John, I'm sorry. Um, if the rise at the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel is a quarter inch per year, but, I mean, wouldn't that be two and a half feet if in there, 50 years? If uh, a quarter inch a year would be an inch every four years, uh, four times 12 would be 48 years. I, I did it wrong. Okay, okay. That, that's okay. all right. Thank you. Now, this is, pertains to the coastal storms. This is a handy table that our emergency managers and the fire department uh, use, and I want to thank them for letting us use it. Amongst other things, it shows the 15 storms at the Sewell's Point gauge that produced the highest water surface level. That gauge is the oldest in the area. It's been in operation now for 87 years. It's interesting to note of those 15 storms, nine of them occurred within just the last 16 <coughs> years. That definitely, definitely suggests a short-term trend at the very least. I point out to the council that the left-hand or your right-hand column that shows the water surface levels that's reference to a tidal datum at Sewell's Point. To get it reference to a ground elevation we're all used to, you would subtract 1.61 from those numbers. 
which we've done, and here are the water surface elevations for those nine storms in Long Creek adjacent to the Eastern Shore Drive area. The highest of those nine was Norida, that produced a tide elevation of almost seven. I draw your attention to Hurricane Sandy, produced an elevation about five, seven. We'll be looking a little bit more of that in just a slide or two. Bottom line, sea level rise plus coastal storms is resulting in increased flooding in many areas around the city, but the Eastern Shore Drive area seems to be one that's really feeling the effects right now. This map, the red stars, shows the areas where we're aware of some level of flooding that occurred during Hurricane Sandy, which of course for us was not a hurricane, it was a northeaster. Some of the flooding was relatively minor. Up in Eastern Shore Drive, there was some flooding of structures. I'm going to focus on that area. At Dockside, um, the boat obviously is in Long Creek. The car's in the parking lot. That boat's usually several feet lower than the car. Next door at um, Bubba's and the Shellfish Company, which we'll get this to. Mike, would you advance that? There we go. I think the photo speaks for itself. You know, this isn't necessarily the peak water surface rise. That's just when staff could get out there and take photographs. I'd also remind you that Norida was about 1.2 feet, two feet higher. Down in Lynn Haven Colony, this is a picture on Lynn Haven <coughs> Drive and Lynn Road. If you look at the rancher in the background, the water's about up to the windowsill. Just another shot in Lynn Haven Colony. This is up on Cape Henry Drive in Lynn Haven Colony. You're facing west. You're like at the Citrus restaurant or so. You're looking west. Shows some of the flooding. This photo shows the true extent and nature of it. Back in Lynn Haven Colony, that's a mailbox in the foreground. That black, black object kind of shows how deep the water was there. Now we're over in Cape Henry. This is Wake Forest Street. It is a small boat that's taken advantage of the flood to go boating in Wake Forest Street. And just a last photograph of a house that's experiencing some flooding. So the Eastern Shore Drive area is a particularly vulnerable area, vulnerable to sea level rise, storm surge, coastal storms, and even high tides if the wind just blows out of the north for a number of days. And one of the main reasons why is how low this area is. This is a colorized topo map. It shows <clears throat> ground elevations by color. The bluish tint is elevation four and lower. The pink is elevation four to six. The green is six to eight. The orange is 8 to 10, and the white, what little there is, is above 10. If you recall, Sandy had a tide of about 5, 7. That's all the blue and most of the pink. Pink and Norida to almost 7. That's all the blue, all the pink, and half of the green. Now, this handy is that diagram. Is taken from the latest FEMA flood map? I'm sorry? Is that an extract from the latest FEMA flood map, the last slide? Uh, no, that's, this is just a topo map that, that, we've, that we've developed. This handy diagram here is our stair step diagram. Uh, we're showing the number of buildings that are potentially vulnerable at each ground elevation. And the way we read this is you start the lower left, there's 73 buildings that are located on ground that the ground elevation is four or lower. Doesn't mean the finished floor is four or lower, but the building is on ground that's four or lower. You go up to the next step, there's 307 buildings that's located on ground that's five or lower. Including the first 73. Including the first, yes, sir. All the way up to elevation 10 and lower, there's 1,400 buildings. I think these series of maps probably show that a little bit better. Up in the upper left corner, we show the elevation that's represented by the orangey color and the number of buildings that are within that area. This is elevation three and lower, there's nine buildings. Four and lower, there's 73. Five and lower, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So I, I think this kind of shows what's going on out there with rising sea levels and coastal storms and as low as the area is, they truly are experiencing flooding. So the next question I want to address, well, what are the general things that we can do about it? The advice to coastal cities and towns is to base a comprehensive response to sea level rise and recurrent flooding on three adaptation strategies. The first one is land use management. Decisions are made about whether you want to continue to occupy the flood-prone areas, and if you do, what land use regulations you want to have in place. The second strategy is the accommodation strategy, where you continue to occupy the flood-prone areas, 
but you learn to adapt to that flooding. You accept, accept that periodically it's going to flood. You can do things like elevate buildings, flood-proof homes, have early warning systems so the folks that live there can make a decision whether they want to leave or not. And in fact, the city has started a reverse 911 call out to this area here. When there's an event, we expect to flood them. <coughs> and where the city engineer's office really comes in is the engineer protection methods. We talked about the interim a little later. We'll get into the comprehensive improve, improvements, excuse me. But when it comes to engineered flood control measures for recurrent sea level rise, those are, those are some complex measures. They consist of flood walls, levees, flood gates, large pump stations, and greatly enhanced drainage systems. Those type of facilities are costly. Our 61st Street pump station down at the beach, we finished up in 2012. That pump station, the ocean outfall, and the trunk line in Atlantic Avenue cost about $20 million. They're O&M intensive. If we build infrastructure like this, we have to maintain it because it needs to work when it's called upon, and it'll be called upon during some of our worst our worst events. We don't want a New Orleans or even a Midtown Tunnel scenario here in our city. But no matter how well you engineer it, no matter how well it's maintained, there's a limit to its effectiveness. I mean, the flood barriers can only be so high and the pumps can only pump out so much. From time to time, when the forces of nature exceed that, you'll typically still have some major flooding. Now, as complex as the measures can be, the basic principles are very straightforward. There's two primary ways to do this. Flood barriers to keep high water out of the flood-prone areas and pumps and enhanced storm drainage inside the flood-prone areas to pump rainwater and minor overtopping out. In the lower right-hand corner, that's a flood wall and a pump station in downtown Norfolk. I think we all recognize where that is with the battleship in the background. To the lower left, that's just one of many flood walls in New Orleans. In fact, New Orleans, this graphic shows the full flood protection system they have. That's probably the best known in this country. There's over 350 miles of flood walls, levees, dikes. It has over 500 openings in it for roads, for railroads and waterways. They all have to have a closure structure. All those structures have to be maintained and operated in advance of an event they think is going to cause flooding. There's over 70 large pump stations inside New Orleans to pump rainwater and minor overtopping out. We're not without some impressive, impressive infrastructure of our own. This is our beautiful resort area. Rudy Inlet, the lower left, Cape Henry up in the upper right. Nice wide beach, but you know that beach is an engineered structure. It's engineered to a certain height and a certain width. It's engineered to work with the outer face of the boardwalk, which is actually a seawall. Seawall goes about 30 feet into the sand. Seawall runs from Rudy Inlet up to 57th Street, after which there's an engineered dune system that goes <coughs> from 57th to 89th. And they're designed to work together to protect against direct wave attack from coastal storms. When we come up to Eastern Shore Drive, we're at Lynn Haven Inlet looking east. It's a nice looking area on its own right too, uh, but there's virtually no engineered uh, protection measures at all up here. That means we kind of have a blank slate. One of the first things we like to do when we have a blank slate is identify the full range of options, the lower limit and the upper limit. With any engineered or built measure, there's always the no build, build alternative. We calculate that to fully protect this area to elevation 10, the entire area, would have an order of magnitude cost of 500 million. Now, we selected 10 because <coughs> the FEMA flood elevation is seven out there plus a three foot sea level rise. When I say order of magnitude on 500 million, I mean that in the mathematical sense. We're comfortable with the number of zeros, but we would not expect that first digit to be any less than five. This is a general concept, and it's very general, from which the 500 million was generated. Again, this is a colorized topo map. Blues and pinks are low, greens, oranges, and whites, whites are higher. But if you start up in, on the Chesapeake Bay, where that first star is in the upper right-hand corner, you work along the coast, you have pretty nice high ground all along here. A few places we have to augment that with flood walls to elevation 10. You turn the corner at Lynn Haven Inlet, and as you come up Long Creek, those are some of the lowest areas, elevations 3, 4s, and 5s. If we wanted to fully protect them, to elevation 10, there'd be three miles of flood wall, and we'd have to have at least five flood gates in it for boating access. 
there will be about a dozen pump stations behind those walls, too, to pump the rainwater and miner overtopping out. Oh, sorry. Did you consider, like, in London and, like, the usual, they have the thing that comes up out of the basin, like the Thames River, where rather than all the seawalls, they block the water from coming into the waterway to start with at Rudy Inlet, so something would rise from the bottom and form a coffer dam, and that was cheaper for London to do than seawalls. Can, can I say this, Mr. Moss? Not yet, but stay tuned, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to approach this. Okay. All right. Uh, probably a good time to pause and take stock of where we are, 500 million price tag. Okay, this is a summary thus far. Sea level seems to have risen about a foot in the last 50 years. It's projected to rise one and a half to three feet in the next 50. Coastal storms seem to be increasing in frequency and intensity. This area is very low and vulnerable. Norida has already produced a flood elevation of about seven. Without flood protection measures, it's likely this area will experience increasing flooding. But flood protection measures for the entire area at elevation 10 have a major impact on this, on this community, both in acquisition and essentially you're building a wall around it and are very, very costly. So we felt the question was really, is it all or nothing, or is there an initial level of things that we can do, a core set of improvements, if you will, that satisfy these three factors here? One, we wanted to provide a level of flood protection in the near term. We wanted whatever we did to be expandable in the future, to be fully integrated in any expanded measures that may take place in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And we wanted them to be minimally disruptive to this area. That means we wanted to reduce the number of flood walls particularly. So we set about to generate alternatives that satisfy those three factors. We further developed these guidelines to assist us. We wanted to reduce the overall cost. We wanted the improvements to be phased so that the initial phases would be the ones with the most benefit. We wanted to leverage existing infrastructure and natural topography. The next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll go over what I mean by that. Again, we wanted to minimize the impacts in and around the neighborhoods of acquisition and huge flood walls. There's very limited water quality treatment of this area. If possible, we want to provide a level of water quality treatment. And last but not least, we wanted whatever we do to be able to be integrated with any future improvements that may become necessary or may, or may be desired. Again, we're hopefully, I think, the last time you see the colorized topo map. Uh, blue and pink is low. Green, orange, and white is higher. There's really two distinct areas of, that, that are low here in the Eastern Shore Drive. The first one is the tidally adjacent area adjacent to Long Creek. It runs virtually the entire width. We've seen from the $500 million concept, it would take a flood wall and flood gates to protect that area. There is a second low area that's centered along Shore Drive and the Cape Henry Drive ditch that has pretty high ground along the Chesapeake Bay to the north that provides somewhat of a natural barrier now. And an old ridge line to the south that west of Great Neck Road is a pretty, is a pretty continuous ridge line, a few gaps in it. East of Great Neck Road is a lot spottier, but it's still there. So, we focused our efforts on this area here to use the, nat the natural topography and minimize the use of flood walls. The first option that we looked at we called the bay discharge option, estimated cost $230 million. Here to be five pump stations, two large ones with submarine outfalls going to the Chesapeake Bay. That would require large trunk lines <coughs> of shore drive and three smaller ones to Long Creek. This would protect the elevation seven, both West of um, Great Neck Road, this was not a flood wall. This is elevating uh, Lynn Haven Drive and a portion of West Great Neck Road, about a foot and a half. East of Great Neck Road would require about a mile of flood wall to protect the elevation seven. Look for ways to reduce that cost. If we take all the flow to Long Creek and eliminate the two big pump stations on the Chesapeake Bay and the submarine outfalls, uh, we can provide the same level of service at a budget of about $139 million. Looking to further reduce that and to rely solely on the natural topography out there, we eliminated the flood wall for the eastern portion. That reduces the cost almost $60 million. The western portion would still be protected to elevation 7. The eastern portion would now be protected to elevation 5. 
That does lend itself to five phases. Phase 1A and 1B, west of Great Neck Road. Phases 2, 3A, and 3B, east of Great Neck Road. I'll go over those. The first phase, 1A, is at the foot of the Lesnar Bridge. This is a low area. Whenever we have a northeast or a significant coastal event, it becomes virtually impassable. At least if you have a low riding car, it does. We'd install about a 60 CFS pump station, uh, associated uh, drainage. This would uh, keep about 1,500 feet of road passable to elevation seven that would otherwise flood. And it would mitigate flooding to two townhome buildings. Those townhomes have an assessed value. This is just a building, it's not the land. This is just a building, all these assessed values of about 1.1 million. This phase would cost nine million, take two years to design a permit and two years to build. The next phase is the largest phase and the one with the most benefit. This is phase 1B. It's centered along Cape Henry Drive and the Cape Henry Drive ditch. Be two pump stations, a 50 cubic feet per second pump station on the western end of the ditch and a larger one, 150 cubic feet per second, where the ditch turns down and drains to Long Creek. Uh, this would uh, protect the elevation seven would keep almost three miles of road passable up to elevation seven that would otherwise flood. This would mitigate flooding for 152 buildings. Now this is not GIS information, this is finished floor here. We, we do have some survey information. And those buildings have an assessed value of 55 million. Again, that's just the structure, that's not the land. Uh, this phase would cost 41 million. This one would probably take three years to design a permit. There's a little more meat here and about two years to build. Now, this is the Cape Henry Drive ditch right now. It has its water quality and aesthetic issues. With uh, phase 1B, we would regrade that and widen that ditch. And this is an artist rendering, and you're dealing with engineers here, so it's about as high as art as we can get. <laughs> but anyhow, we would uh, take advantage of the ditch for some water quality treatment. He's right. We would open up each of the roadway crossings. You can see they're just bunch of ugly little pipes now for improved flow and for <coughs> improved aesthetics there. Now when we cross Great Neck Road and go on the east side, this is Cape Story by the Sea. There's an existing pump station there, the Poinciana Pump Station. It's at its end of its useful life. It needs to be replaced. It's on our backlog list. It costs about four and a half million to replace that. In this phase, instead of just replacing it, we'd upgrade it to 80 CFS. This would uh, Call on the east side, we're protecting the elevation five, keep about 1,800 linear feet of road passable, we mitigate flooding up to that elevation for eight homes, uh, cost seven and a half million, take two years to design a permit and another two <coughs> years to build. Can I just pause for a quick? When you sure. talk about all the pump stations, I assume you're having auxiliary power at all those stations and they're elevated. Are you going to make those gas powered so they don't have to worry about storage fuel? Or that? I don't think we've gotten that far yet. Okay, I just but. I just throw that out there because a lot of people are going to natural <coughs> gas on the auxiliary systems okay. because of all their issues in fuel. and fuel. Certainly, something we're take we're taking note of, sir. Okay, the phase three A that's Cape Henry. The the green spot right there is where we're putting in that sluice gate as an interim measure. We put a smaller 20 CFS pump station upstream of that, a little bit of associated drainage, protect elevation five, keep about 3,000 linear feet of road passable, prevent seven houses from flooding until the tide exceeded elevation five. This phase costs four and a half million. Again, take two years on a permit, two years to build. The final phase, 3B, is actually on the bay side of Shore Drive. This area is primarily experiencing severe nuisance flooding uh, to the point of affecting access to homes along there. This phase goes from the state park to about, I believe it's Bayberry. We installed two smaller 10 CFS pump stations. They would discharge onto the beach via buried dispersion structures like a lot of the flow out to the beach up there right now uses. Keep about 2,500 linear feet of road passable improve access to 43 homes. This phase is nine million. Again, take two years to design a permit and two years to build. This is a summary chart. Left-hand column is the phase. The next column is the cost of each phase. Um, this column is the number of buildings that would be directly protected from flooding that currently flood now that won't with these improvements and their assessed value of just the buildings. I believe if we add land in there, I believe the total assessed value of buildings and land is about 132 million. <clears throat> I also point out that phase 1A and 1B, 
prevent us from having to uh, increase the budget on shore drive phase three by about $15 million to put in a large trunk line that's not needed with these phases. And in phase two, we need to spend four and a half million to rebuild that pump station anyhow. The next column is the total number of buildings within the area served. They may not be flooding, but there may be an intangible benefit. <coughs> and the final column is a linear feed of roadway that's kept passable to either elevation five or seven. I'd also note that each phase is, can, be, can be independently built. It stands on its own. So when we look at the positive considerations, uh, the uh, Southern Discharge Alternative provides flood protection for a fairly significant area of the Eastern Shore Drive. The improvements can be fully integrated in the future <coughs> with additional improvements, does minimize acquisition and infrastructure impacts to these neighborhoods. It does reduce the cost for Shore Drive Phase 3 by about $15 million. We do utilize existing infrastructure and existing, and existing topography to the extent we can. It's a very constructible phasing sequence, and it addresses the issues of water quality and aesthetics in the Cape Henry Drive ditch. It's not without, without its limitations. Uh, it serves about 260 acres of the 676-acre watershed. About another 200 acres is already at elevation 7 or higher, mostly along the bay. Level service for phases 1A and 1B is a tidal elevation of 7, 10-year rainfall. For phases 2, 3A, 3B, elevation 5, and a 2-year rainfall. Now, before getting to the recommendation part, I wanted to take a little bit of time to look at the bigger picture of sea level rise and recurrent flooding. Please recall there's three adaptation strategies that has recommended communities on the coast um, build their response to sea level rise, recurrent flooding on these three strategies. This is just a diagram of those three strategies. We've been focusing on the engineer protection measures and more specifically what we call the micro approach where we're looking at a sub area within a larger watershed. In this case, Eastern Shore Drive area as opposed to the entire Lynn Haven watershed. There's also the macro approach where we would consider either the city as a whole or any of its four major watersheds. At this level, the four watersheds would be the Elizabeth River, the Lynn Haven, the Ocean Front, and the Southern Watersheds. There's also the accommodation strategy, what role that could play, as well as land use management, what role that could play. Real quick, with engineer protection measures, the micro approach is very neighborhood specific. You look at one area at a time does lend itself to phasing and it may be more readily funded as the improvements are generally on a smaller scale than the macro approach. You may have large facilities, Mr. Moss, like you were referring to. With the macro approach, it is comprehensive. You look at the entire watershed. You may find some improvements that would have benefits for either the entire watershed or a significant portion thereof. You do have to fund the upfront analysis and the improvement costs on the macro scale. Some of those large floodgates we showed earlier on, uh, they may be a little bit higher than the micro approach. Not without precedent here, again, our oceanfront beach erosion control and hurricane protection plan, our total investment in that is probably about, probably about $200 million. Uh, just some approaches in New Orleans that are in place, a couple of big floodgates on various waterways in New Orleans. Some planned approaches in New York City. After Hurricane Sandy, they got very serious. They've generated a, a program of about $20 billion worth of uh, post-Sandy responses. Some of the plans are for a flood wall around lower, around lower Manhattan. And this is just a planned floodgate in Newtown Creek, which is a major tributary to the East River. On the accommodation strategy, this is where we make the decision to continue to occupy flood-prone areas, but we do people just accept the fact that periodically is going to flood there, and they take measures to help them adapt to that periodic flooding, such as elevate buildings, flood-proof <coughs> buildings, City has uh, started the reverse 911 system, and that allows citizens in those areas to make a decision whether they want to evacuate or not. Now, this slide here, I'm going to attempt to show what uh, accommodation strategy means, what it does, but what it doesn't do. These are cross sections through the Eastern Shore Drive area. They're animated. Uh, this is through Lynn Haven Colony on the top, through Cape Story by the Sea on the bottom. 
on both cross sections, Chesapeake Bay is to the left, Long Creek is to the right. This is a nice summer day, high tide of about 1.2. Sandy came along, is about 5.7. <clears throat> Clearly houses could have been built so their finished floors were above that elevation. Norida was about 6.9, same thing here, houses could have been built so their finished floors were above that elevation. And even in our ultimate planning water surface level of 10 houses could still be built above that. <clears throat> but when it does flood, if people have made a decision to stay in that area, they're going to be left there by themselves until that flood water goes down. If they leave the area, they're not coming back until the flood water goes down. And the repeated periodic flooding of the public infrastructure, the roads and utilities, that eventually takes a toll. So it's not a free lunch to the accommodation strategy. With land use management, there's major policy issues associated with making decisions on whether to continue to occupy flood prone areas. We just listed a few that we could think of, some of the city goals that have to be looked at, looked at like community for a lifetime, neighborhood revitalization, planning for the future, and financial sustainability. So I, I think in the end, the city's response to sea level rise, recurrent flooding will ultimately likely include all three adaptation strategies. I think right now a comprehensive sea level rise <laughs> recurrent flooding analysis could serve as the initial basis for starting to develop our approach to sea level rise recurrent flooding. Such an analysis, we'd identify the probable extent of sea level rise recurrent flooding. And in each of the vulnerable areas we identified, we'd look at the three adaptation strategies and determine what the appropriate role of each was, as well as identify the budgetary costs for any program measures that, that were recommended. So finally, we're to the recommendations. We have two concurrent recommendations. The first one is to proceed with the engineering and the acquisition for the Southern Discharge Alternative for Eastern Shore Drive for phases 1A, 1B, and 2, and to program 3A and 3B in the later years of the CIP. At the same time, initiate a comprehensive sea level rise recurrent flooding analysis with the initial focus on the Lynn Haven watershed. There is funding in the proposed stormwater CIP to cover both of these costs, and future costs could be evaluated and considered with future CIPs. So closing thoughts on these two recommendations. I think the Southern Discharge Alternative for Eastern Shore Drive is a very measured response to the flooding out there. It does provide flood protection for a significant part of Eastern Shore Drive. Uh, that flood protection can be built upon in the future. And it's minimally disruptive at this time to the neighborhoods out there. We're not building large seawalls and acquiring a lot of property. Same time, flood protection is limited to elevation 7 in phases 1A and 1B and the 5 in 2, 3A and 3B. Comprehensive sea level rise flooding analysis starting with Lynn Haven watershed can serve as a basis on which to base our overall response to the issue in this watershed, would identify vulnerable areas, evaluate the role of each of the three adaptation strategies, and finally identify any budget costs and possible funding options to cover those. And with that, that concludes this presentation. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. Let me just say a very good presentation. I thank you for it. Uh, questions or comments, Amelia? I wanted to ask, because as brothers, did they have a fatality at all at that time? What I'm not aware of any, of any fatalities. In fact, I, this is anecdotal, okay. but I understand they were open that afternoon. Oh, that's so that's true. an excellent example that's true of accommodation. Right. <laughs> they, they've, they've learned to deal with it. Okay. That doesn't mean they like it, but they've learned to deal with it. But overall, have we had any that you can recall over those nine I am not aware of any fatalities. I think down here in the coastal plain, we're, we're graced with pretty still water. It gets high, but it's still up in the hills in the Piedmont and the mountains. It gushes down those valleys, and that's where you generally have a lot of problems with injuries and fatalities. Okay. Here are some of the high waters. I just want people to stay out of them. You saw that one car somebody tried to go through. Yeah, we got quite a few more questions. We've got John, Barbara, Brad, and then John. So, uh, John Moss. I hope that when we do the study, since I know the Navy spent a small fortune to collect a lot of raw data on just the bay as a whole and sea level rise where they adopted their strategy for three feet is what they did. Hopefully that's all in the public record that 
we would acquire that study and not pay for data collection from sure. consultants twice. Because I think that was a very, if you haven't seen that study, it's done a very good job. And they've looked at a lot of stuff over it, too. But I thought hopefully you were going to be addressing the really points that I made. Because you look at the map on slide 14, and, and you look at the number of areas that also deal with when the high floods, because of the, the Australia, Kings Grant, all those other communities are all dealing with the, the rising tide and the lack of the outfalls. So if you're looking at the more longer term and assume that there's a three-foot rise and model that across all those outfalls that we have where the stormwater would come up and the water couldn't drain away, then really when you look at that whole idea of having the, the, the car for dam was very different ways. Holland's taken one approach, you know, and sluices and other people have taken an approach with the rise up dam like they have. And that becomes much more engineering, more attractive on a dollar cost basis because now the cost, while capital intensive, to do that, barrier, because you said the sand covers it, it's actually cheaper to defend the one place where the tide water is coming in than it is to try to defend all the places once it's in from rising up on the property. So I, I think we have to really think hard when we're at the opportunity cost of even beginning down a route that takes us down the, <clears throat> uh, the micro fixes when in reality you start looking all there, that's true, the three-foot sea level rise, some places that now aren't problems, <coughs> and only closing that inlet as a place for that flood water to come in is really going to address fundamentally at the cheapest point, I believe, that cost. But that's just an observation. But coming back to where the project costs, what are, because when we did the 1.3 cents per day increase in the stormwater management Fund. We had to do that just to cover the labor costs for those positions because we had no spare money. So what gets unfunded to get that funded? At this point, I believe um, for Eastern Shore Drive, and um, I'm not sure I have the entire answer for you, I believe they'd be looking at bonding that $71 million option. Right. So and using the revenues, you know, this true, generated by the utility to cover that. If I look at the CIP, the revenues that are currently coming in have been allocated to projects. So if we decide to not do projects to free up cash dollars to then bond more debt, still something that's in here that's now funded must be unfunded to free up the revenues to pay for the debt. Either that or we didn't need the 1.3 cent increase for labor on the fund. I'm just trying to figure out how the math works. Well... I think within the stormwater CIP, I, I think you're on to something here. It's about a little over $15 million a year. About $11 million is that for operation and maintenance of the system. We have a huge system out there. It has to be maintained so flow keeps flowing and people don't flood. Uh, I do believe that's why the recommendation is proceed with the design and acquisition of phases 1A, 1B, and uh, two, and then future funding needs would be the subject of future CIPs and considerations by this council. Well, if I'm looking on, and I realize you're not looking, but this is just to follow up later, definitely would be deafer. I look at page 4-156 of the CIP, I see stormwater utility bonds, and they're allocated to different projects, but clearly there would need to be some different racking and stacking than what we see here, and all I'm asking is, since that will be a reconciliation <coughs> item, just so us easy people who could look, we could just compare what we got, because this might be something we need to do, but just where the trade-off is that made that possible. Councilman, we would reduce our pay-go amount. We use a considerable amount of pay-go in that long term. So then the, when, I, when I look through any project, this pay-go would not be done. Well, we'd probably revert to long-term debt, probably reduce the amount of pay-go associated and convert that to debt service. Okay. So what you figure out is you cut enough pay-go so that you could do all the pay-go projects plus the design and acquisition and do right. to debt. Okay. Right. I mean, that would be the logical move, but this this briefing here is really for you all to look at those phases and determine your appetite <clears throat> based on that return on investment uh, chart that's up on the screen right now, whether or not you really want to proceed down here. Well, well my just, as I could, Mr. Mayor, just sure. is that my initial thing is I understand when people, your home's flooding now, you're not interested about what you could do with three more years from now so I can appreciate all that. So maybe there's some little piece. But I really think, in my own view, when I look at how much of our place is really exposed, and I'm not an engineer, but I know this has been done in other countries successfully, 
that dealing comprehensively with the, where the water's flowing from is through that Flint Haven River, that that to me seems like it's going to be the most cost-effective way to deal with flooding and then the land use rather than the balkanization around and end up with a, kind of a New Orleans approach piecemeal. That's just my <coughs> observation. I'm not an engineer, but that seems to make sense to me. I think that's pretty much the same conclusion we've come to. And the, keep in mind, this is not the only area of the city that's having these problems or is going to have them, which is your point. Uh, we've had conversations with the Army Corps of Engineers in terms of if we go macro instead of micro, there's going to have to be a federal participation in this. No question in my mind on that one. We're working regionally at the planning district to create <clears throat> uh, some momentum for that kind of a demonstration project. But it was a great presentation. Good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and this doesn't address those tidally adjacent properties uh, oh. by any means, any of these phases. And, uh, you know, I would ask Rose Hall, do you think you're affected by that? And if you're living in Windsor Woods on the south side of the interstate, those eight-foot pipes that drain the lower part of the western branch are, we had 10 homes go underwater in the middle of the Norida that are 15 rows away from the water, but the whole stormwater system backed up, went into the roads, and then went down the road and found all those low, low, low homes. So it's, it's pretty extensive. Yep. Okay, we got some more questions. Barbara? Well... It's a long-range question and, and so forth broad, but, you know, we, we wrestle with this stormwater fee, and I thought this was what John was going to ask. I you know, many times I stopped. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, and, and it's very hard to explain to people how that keeps going up, 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 but if we're going to use that source to address <clears throat> sea level rise, then it is going to keep going up, 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 up. And I just don't know how we justify it, especially if we're calling it stormwater fee. I mean, I think we're really going to have to come up with determining what we're trying to address. And there probably, somehow or other, we're going to have to do different funding sources for the different causes because this, the sea level rise issue is an, you know, a, a very different thing, but you know, I'm kind of maxed out on being able to explain to my folks why just getting their ditch dug every now and then is the reason that theirs keeps going up, <coughs> and um, it, it 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 gets old. So I mean, we've got two entirely different things we're dealing with. We're dealing with what comes out of the sky as precipitation, and then we're dealing with the Tons. sea level rise, and they're two very different things. And I think they've got to have different funding sources. Point. And your point's taken. That's why in a comprehensive analysis, looking at funding options would be part of that analysis. What are the most appropriate funding means? Once we start going down this road, though, when do we, when do we decide we're not going to keep going down that road using stormwater fees, is what I'm saying. Uh, Brad? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's a great presentation, John. I like it when you talk engineering. Um, and I know you've got a lot of good people on this. The, the slide up here is identifying all the private property that's impacted Correct. by these flows. Correct. Is there any analysis, is there an analysis underway of when we start talking about the public infrastructure, the roads? Obviously, when the water rises to, to four and five and six elevation, we've got sanitary sewer manholes and pump stations that are underwater at that point. Um, is that going to be a third presentation that we'll see in six months or is that it's not planned at this point Mr. Martin okay. right now we're focusing on the actual buildings and noting right. in the form of the roads that are passable which you can see these improvements would keep about five miles passable that would otherwise flood versus versus raising those roads up and, and having all the challenges to the infrastructure sure okay. and, yeah. We've yeah. just got Getting such a roads higher than the surrounding properties and everything that goes along with that. We've just got such a mixing bowl of of initiatives, whether it's the floodplain elevation or this or um, new stormwater stuff, where you're going to end up with one house next to another house like that, and you're going to have a flat driveway and a driveway that's going up at a 45 degree angle to the next house, and it's yeah. just there's I, so I, much. <coughs> in this. I think we're already seeing Good. that in Lynn Haven Colony. Yeah. You did a great job with it. Thank you. Jim. Thanks. Can you go to slide 51 for me? <clears throat> and I think it's important. For, first off, I, Mr. Spore, if, if you wouldn't mind, if you could make sure that this 
is online because there's a lot of people in Shore Drive that um, that are watching this, and I know there's a lot more that would like to would like to view this um, this entire um, PowerPoint because it's it's very powerful, very good. Um, you know, the staff has recommended uh, an overall pro global approach to the, for the entire city, and I think that's something that we certainly have to do. I mean, we're talking about five hundred million dollars minimum. I mean, I, I like how you said you know you have confidence in the last numbers, but the first number might be higher than five. That was a nice way of putting you know putting that. But um, you know, it's that's that's clearly not not sustainable for uh, for the city. Um, but 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 looking at this globally is very important. What, what John talked about in terms of some sort of dam system or something like that to keep it uh, to, you know, beyond the surface certainly looks like it would be something that, that would work. You know, I can think of about a thousand reasons why it wouldn't work, but but that's why we have guys like you that, that are smarter about this stuff that, um, than me. But, but when you look at these various options, I think that once we take a look at this global strategy, I think we're going to end up doing a combination of all three of these. I, I don't think there's any possible way, and I think we just have to be realistic about it, that everything we can do is, is to protect the entire city this way. There, there's going to have to be some land use changes. There's going to have to be some accommodations and, and, and certainly protection. But, um, you know, if you take a look at this just just on the surface, you know, everybody's home is, is important to them. But, but then, you, then you take back, can you go back to that last slide we were at? Um, we should Summary say, slide, I think it was 46 months. <clears throat> If you take a look at what's protected, you know, and how much you're spending and, and then the value of, of that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, if, if you're one of the two people, you know, whose house is being protected by that $9 million, you know, $100 million is not enough. But, but, again, if you're somebody who's living in the southern part of the city who's concerned about their ditch and, and you're trying to explain to them why you're going to spend $9 million, <coughs> to protect, you know, two houses, that's, that, that makes life a, a little bit more difficult. So, so we're, I, I think we're going to have a lot, of, a lot of difficult decisions as we go through this. But, but the only way to look at this is on a citywide basis, I think, because when, when you look at the, those stars showing the flooding all over, we think about, Bobby, how many years ago was right, it with... Rosemont Forest, where, where we had to had to spend money there because of an elevation problem, and and we're just going to see more and more of that. So so I, I think I think the staff's done an outstanding job on it. I think the recommendation to to pursue a a global uh, solution to this is important, and I think the council needs to be um, needs to be ready to have some frank discussions <clears throat> about management, accommodation, and protection, and 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 what hybrid system we use. In different areas because it's not all it's not all the same. I mean, you know, I, you know, th this is a heck of a lot of money to put in on in one area that's not Bayside, and, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I, could, I could agree with you more. Flooding is not allowed in Bayside. But but you know, uh, some thoughts and what you just said, Jim, was really good, and all the comments have been good, but. The New York and New Orleans walls, how much of that was paid for by the federal government? Uh, over time, I couldn't tell you. I know that after Hurricane, a after Hurricane Katrina, about $14.5 billion worth of federal yeah. money and, flowed and I get, New Orleans. And, and, and yeah. my point, and even if we look back at what we did down at the north end and along the beach, that was 65 cents of every dollar, I believe, wasn't it? The federal money? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> As I recall. And, I guess where I'm coming from is I think it's time for us to make sure, I'm sure y'all are probably ahead of us, but we got to bring the Fed, you know, and I mean, we got to get to our elected officials here and, and pay me now or pay me later. I mean, if, you, if you look at the disasters that have occurred and then they had to do it, uh, I think we're trying to be ahead of the game, which I really applaud us doing. And, but there are some things we're going to have to do, you know, like land management and planning and so forth that, you know, it's going to be tough on property owners and so forth. ARP in the north. <laughs> <laughs> well, well okay. you know, <clears throat> there's going to be some okay. things we're going to have to do. And uh, But uh, where are we as far as the – I'm sure the course is they have no money for anything. I guess I hope I'm wrong about what I just said, but am I? Well, right now, I know uh, we have quarterly meetings with the Corps of Engineers. I think we just had one. It was a week or two ago, and we did broach the subject with the right. colonel, and I don't think he has a magic pot of money, but he's 
you know, listening to what we have to well, say. Well, and they see the need. I mean, this is just pure common sense. Yeah, yeah and he very, was very clear. They've got three priorities for the future. Uh, the port and the military, the uh, hurricane protection and uh, evacuation and sea level rise. Those are the three priorities. Well, that fits. They're, they're looking for some solutions that they can uh, think they're keeping. Part of what's driving us to go this macro route is that, that there may be some, some real fruit there. Well, I'm going to throw it to you, to, uh, Council. I'm going to suggest to the city manager that he get with our uh, with our lobbyists in D.C., who are very, very good, and come up with a plan on how we get this information to our friends in Washington. we got to get them in the game now. I hope you all are in agreement. Yeah, you know, let's get them in the game now. Let them know where we're heading, you know, and, and let's put show the price tag on this, Jesse. And, and, and Mayor, I would say, you know, <clears throat> the, the solution John mentioned about, you know, very aggressive major capital projects like that. I mean, that may be what we need to do. And, um, you know, I mean, we, when you look at a $20 billion project in New York, that's probably similar to dust building a fire station. But, but you know, yeah, yeah. but for us, it's, 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 a, big, it's a big deal. And, and I think that we, we could, we ought to take a look at big, big uh, solutions to this that, for that, the city. That, that will last for a long time. Oh, yeah, for, for the city. Yeah. And, and I'm a, you know, when I've, Years ago, when we started talking about these things occurring, and there were a lot of doubters that what could be done would work. But we have seen it work now. We've seen these major investments really working. You've seen it in your area, Bobby. Mm -hmm. We've seen it at the North End when people, first time, that pump was, everyone said, oh, that water's still going to be on Atlantic <laughs> Avenue. Well, what? Yep, you know, so we, we've seen this stuff work. The investments pay off. So, Bobby? There would also the uh, Department of Defense have investors. Well, I think that's where we get our federal guys telling us. Yeah, that's why, you know, it's part of it. You know, make your argument. It's going to be the court's first concern, really. Yeah. Yeah. But any other questions or comments? I, again, just a really good presentation. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to be looking at it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay.